we are resuming our series. We took a one-week break last week through Philippians. Two weeks ago, we saw um, in verses 2 to 7 of chapter 4 that true peace comes from God. And two ways that we can experience this peace, this true peace that the world really can offer, is through joy and prayer. We saw that two weeks ago. So if I'm a Jesus follower today, if I call myself a Christian, we can, can we not, rejoice in Jesus. We can pray about everything, everything small and big with thanksgiving. We also can sing these words that we sang two weeks ago. So on the screen. Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Now, today's verses, 8 and 9, flow from this reality that true peace comes from God, and it also comes from the truth that Christians are citizens of heaven. Today's two verses Uh, give us two more commands we're going to see on how to enjoy our citizenship in heaven in this life and also to enjoy peace with God. So if you don't mind, uh, and to honor the reading of God's word, let's stand. And even if whoever you are watching, so that includes my wife and my son, because my son's a little under the weather right now. Uh, Let's stand for the reading of God's holy and precious and perfect word. So Philippians chapter 4. Verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul penned these words as inspired by the Holy Spirit back in the first century and also today in the 21st. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now, I think it's safe to assume that all of us have heard or seen something in the news or social media about what's been happening in Israel, right? what's, what has happened in Israel. And before you start wondering, what am I, what am I going to say? Uh, I'm not going to be talking about politics, of all the political stuff that's involved. I'm not going to be talking about the history of whose land it is and all that. All right? That's a big topic topic of uh, discussion and debate. So if you, want, if you want to talk about Zionism, Gaza, Hamas, the two-state solution, 1948, um, I don't know, other stuff about that, uh, we can talk in private. Uh, that's not for a public, public conversation. The pulpit that I'm standing in is not for political posturing. It's, this is not a political place except for this political message. Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King. Repent and believe the good news because the kingdom of God is here. That's a political message. So we're not going to be talking about Israeli politics and all that kind of stuff because that is not the point of today's verses. I don't see that here in verses 8 and 9. But I do, excuse me, want us to think about one aspect, one, just one little thing that happened two Saturdays ago. Now, on the same day when the terrorist attacks happened, and they, those were terrorist attacks, and that happened in Israel, various student groups at some of the most elite universities in our country put out statements basically in support of the violence, the murder, and the kidnappings. You're thinking, what? To put it nicely, 
basically these statements were, I would say, tone deaf. They were terrible. So, for example, I have three examples. Here are the first and last sentences from over 30 student groups at Harvard on the screen. So they wrote this. We, the undersigned student organizations, hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. We call on the Harvard community to take action to stop the ongoing annihilation of Palestinians. So this came out on Saturday, right after those attacks. So for these Harvard students, it seems the terrorists are not responsible for their violent actions. Only the government of Israel, as they say, is entirely responsible for all the death and destruction. Okay, uh, here are a few words from a student organization at Tufts University, located in Boston. This is what they wrote. Footage of liberation fighters from Gaza paragliding into occupied territory has especially shown the creativity necessary to take back stolen land. It has not been without cost, as hundreds of Palestinians have been martyred in the past days, fighting to liberate themselves and their land. So uh, I guess creativity is okay when whole families are murdered in their homes and people are kidnapped. And apparently these terrorists are liberation fighters fighting to take back stolen land. All right, here are a couple of sentences from a student group at UC Berkeley. They wrote this. <clears throat> we display our unwavering support of the resistance in Gaza in the broader occupied Palestinian lands. We support the resistance we support the liberation movement, and we indisputably support the uprising. Glory to Palestine, glory to the resistance, and glory to our martyrs. So I have been thinking this past week as to why <coughs> these educated students who are studying at some of the most famous universities in the world, why would they write such hurtful words when they are families in both Israel and Gaza who are in deep pain and sorrow? I mean, they wrote these statements on the same day as those attacks, two Saturdays ago. How could so many young adults think so badly how could so many others follow this bad example? Shouldn't at least we weep with those who weep? Now, no matter, so you might be thinking, are you trying to make a political statement? No, no, no. No matter a person's political views about the Israel and Palestine issue and the lands and all that kind of stuff and what's been happening since in the 20th and the 21st century, that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, whatever your political view on this, we should be able to agree, I think, that murdering civilians, killing babies, and kidnapping senior citizens is wrong, wrong, wrong. These are what? Acts of sheer evil, as President Biden said a few days ago. And theologically speaking, this was sin multiplied on sin multiplied by more sin. And if the military of Israel actively and intentionally targets civilians in Gaza in the next coming days and weeks, then that evil, that sin, should be condemned as well. Two wrongs do not make a right. All right, so how does it happen that some people can think about evil as good in this life? Right, how do we go from calling evil good and call good evil? How does it get all mixed up like that? Well, here's an answer from the Bible. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, <clears throat> God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do what is not right. 
They are filled with all, un- with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. So Romans 1 tells us that our minds, our minds become corrupt when we do not acknowledge God, when we do not believe in Him, then it is only a matter of time when we do what is not right. We will think about evil, we will think about greed, we will think about envy, we will think about, as the Bible says in Romans 1, wickedness. And worse, we will then (laughs) applaud other people to think this way. We will then encourage others to follow bad examples. We will then go down in a moral spiral when we take God out of the picture of our minds. Now, before we go criticizing and condemning other people as terrible thinkers like those college students, you know, you and I can be just as guilty. We can easily fall into the trap of thinking that we are smarter than God. We can deceive ourselves into believing that we are wiser than other human beings. We can trick our minds into following examples that will lead us away from peace with God. For the Philippian Christians here, Paul has told them that they are citizens of heaven, as we saw in chapter 3, verse 20. They belong first to King Jesus more than they do to the Roman Empire. We today belong more to Jesus than we do to the United States of America or some other country out there. And if we are citizens of heaven, like the Philippians, then our thinking must follow the standards of heaven. Our lives should reflect Jesus more than our ethnicities, our cultures, our countries. So in today's verses, Paul gives two commands about living as kingdom of heaven citizens. He shares two imperatives on how to live if we really desire to know the peace of God. So first, think about what's excellent That's the first command. And the second command is follow excellent examples. So we have two main points today. That's it. So let's start number one, which is what? Think about what is excellent. Where do we find that? Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, If there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. All right, so what are these things at the end of verse 8? Well, these are things that are excellent and praiseworthy, as the verse says. But it's not just anything that can be called excellent, because there are many things in our world that are called excellent but are clearly not. So I'll make a little joke here. So we might think, oh, the Dodgers are excellent. No, they're not. You win 100 games in the regular season and get eliminated before the World Series. That was not excellent. The verse says what? Moral excellence. So we who call ourselves Christian are to think about what is, it says here, morally excellent. We should think about what is ethically good. Whatever is morally excellent will be, as it says here, worthy of praise to God. Okay, so what does it mean to think here in this verse? Well, to think about what's excellent means to dwell on it, as the CSB translation says. In other words, we consider, we ponder, we meditate, we contemplate, we carefully focus on that which is excellent. This means we soak our minds with as much praiseworthy and excellent things as possible. So if our mind is like a sponge, 
We should want to dunk it and drench it in the clean water of moral excellence. Just put it in there and just let it just sit in there. We should want our minds to soak up as much praiseworthy excellence as possible. That is what Paul is saying here. We should want our thinking to love God with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. And if we soak and sponge up what is excellent in our minds, what happens? When we just give a teeny tiny squeeze, then our thinking will just ooze out things that are worthy of praise. And as Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, our hearts will reveal what we are really thinking about. So this type of thinking isn't go in one ear and out the other. No, it is deep and good and healthy and peaceful. It's full of feeling. It's full of emotion. It's not dry thinking. And it doesn't lead to bitterness, hatred, jealousy, or any other sin out there. But how do we know something is morally excellent and worthy of praise? All right, what are the excellent qualities that believers must dwell on? Well, from verse 8, we see six. So let's go over them real quick. First, we, we must think about whatever is true. That's what it says. Okay, so what is true? Something that's true is real and authentic and genuine. Whatever is true conforms, fits with God's word, the gospel, with Jesus Christ, because all truth is God's truth. I'm sure you've heard that before. And all moral excellence is excellent to God. I once heard a pastor uh, say that most of us fall into sin because we buy into a lie and then we follow that lie. And we are not alert enough to identify the lie and expose it as a lie and just shine out the truth. And so because we're following the lie and we buy into it, we follow the counterfeit, the fake, the false, And that's what we think about, and we drift from the truth. Second here, it says we must think about whatever is honorable. So we should think about what is noble and decent and dignified. And who should we honor with our thinking? Well, we honor God as first place and number one in our lives. Now, during the LRC anniversary lunch in July, if I remember correctly, a kiddie pool was set up. So I know Brother Tuvi, our elder, and uh, our deacon Eon set up this kiddie pool. They hooked up a hose, and then what happened? Water whoosh, gushed out for the kids to play in, and everybody under the age of 10 jumped in, all the kids, even if they had a swimsuit or not. But what if instead of water that was connected to an outdoor faucet, the water came from sewage? Would the kids still have played in that yucky stuff? I know my son, he still would have jumped in there. But maybe, I would assume, we would all pull our kids out from that filth. Well, when we think, when we sin with dishonorable thoughts, it can start a downward spiral that goes from clean water and ends up with us stuck in mental sewage. Third, it says in verse 8, we must think about whatever is just. Our minds should dwell on what is right. We should love righteousness, and we should care deeply about justice. So when the world talks about justice and doing what is right, we should say yes and amen according to God's word. If not, if we do not care about justice, then our hearts do not need to be sad about all the violence happening in Israel and Gaza and Ukraine, all these other parts of the world. Who cares if we, don't, we shouldn't care about justice? But since God is a God of justice and what is right and good is defined by him, we should care about good and evil and right and wrong as citizens of heaven. Fourth, in verse 8, we must think about whatever is pure, We should dwell on whatever is untainted. We should feed clean thoughts into our minds. 
This means we should be ready to censor and police our thoughts and our minds. We should be ready to filter. We shouldn't even allow a speck of evil to drop into our hearts or minds because then we will become impure. Because when we let sin drip and drip and drip and drip into our hearts and into our minds, our motives will then become tainted. And if we are not pure, then we will not see God as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7. Or 5, 8, excuse me. Fifth, it says here in verse 8, we must think about whatever is lovely. So whatever is attractive, whatever is beautiful, whatever is radiant should fill our minds more and more. This means we just do not think with our brains, right? This thinking here is not just with our heads. No, we also think with our souls. Did you get that? But we think with our affections, our emotions. We enjoy the good, the true, the beautiful in God's creation because it is all lovely. Because I think you would agree with me, no right-thinking person goes to the Grand Canyon or goes to Yosemite or goes to a beautiful mountain and thinks it's ugly or boring. Anyone think Yosemite is ugly? No, we see those places, we should feel how lovely those places are that have been created by God. And we think about them even after we visit them because they are, what, lovely. We don't celebrate an excellent cup of coffee like we had earlier this month, or we don't celebrate world-class music because science tells us, you know, you have your five senses, and when the sound goes into your ear, this happens, blah, 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 or when your taste buds, you know, you feel whatever the coffee is. No, we're not thinking about that when we experience those things. No, we think about these lovely things because of what the emotions they bring, what they do to our minds and our hearts, do they not, Right? And then we can dwell on Jesus because he shines brighter than all the heavenly hosts. We can think about Jesus because he is actually the most lovely. And if we are born again, Jesus should be the most attractive and beautiful to us. Even more than our spouses. And sixth, we must think about whatever, as it says here, is commendable. We should think about whatever is admirable. That's other translations. We should celebrate whatever is highly respected. All right? So what is excellent to think about here? Six things. Truth, honor, justice, purity, loveliness, whatever is admired. Now, sisters and brothers, how are we doing with this list these days? Can we say that we are pursuing these excellent qualities with our hearts and our minds? But you know, this might be a better question to ask ourselves. What practical steps can we practice to help us think about what is excellent? All right, what, what, how do we go about this? Well, here's one suggestion. We must intentionally read the Bible and meditate on it. So Psalm 1 tells us this, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, <clears throat> his delight is in the Lord's instruction, the word, and he meditates on, he thinks about it day and night. So if I want happiness, if I want peace in my life, if I want to think about what is excellent, then I must fill my mind with the Word of God. I must keep engaging with the Bible. I must read and think. I must think and read. You know what's amazing about Scripture, the Word of God? The Bible is morally excellent. The Bible is true. The Bible is profitable, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, 
for correcting and training us. Amen? But you know, if we are honest with ourselves, and we are in church, so we, we, should, we should be honest, if we try to be, it's rare that any of us just randomly reads the Bible during the week. Highly doubtful. Instead, we probably know that reading and thinking about the Bible is most beneficial when we, what? Have a plan. When we make a plan. Spontaneous reading and thinking usually doesn't help that much. So a great question to ask ourselves, and really to ask each other, is what am I reading these days from God's Word? What's the Bible teaching me recently? What's the Bible teaching you recently? And you. Because as great as it is, you know, to read the Bible on Sunday mornings in the church and with the church and think about what the Word says, this can't be the only Bible time for me during the week. It really shouldn't. I need to saturate my soul and sponge it up during the week. Or my soul will then, it will shrivel up and dry out with less joy and less peace. And, you know, by the way, we do have Wednesday Bible study as we're going through 1 Corinthians right now, if you want to join us. It's open to everybody. Another practical way is we need to pray. So Philippians 4, verse 6, from two weeks ago, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, prayer, talking to God, is not some random stream of consciousness talking. It's not babbling. That's not prayer. Prayer requires thinking. Prayer is what? It's a conversation with the creator, God, of the universe. And if I value prayer, I will not just pray by myself, will I? No, I will desire to pray with others. I will want to pray with fellow Christians in the church because I know this will help me to think about God more and how excellent he is. So LRC family and friends, today after service is our Sunday monthly prayer. I assume Brother Martin has prepared ahead of time for our prayer gathering. Correct, Brother Martin? All right, said yes. I doubt... He is going to lead us without having thought about how he's going to lead us. I'm certain he's ready to share and facilitate, and we're going to follow him. So my encouragement to us is, let's stay and pray together. All right, third thing, third practical step. We should think about our affections for Jesus. Now, this past week, I caught myself multiple times getting angry and frustrated and upset while looking at social media. Why? Because I would read a post or I would see a picture that would make me upset. And then I slowly realized that certain people that I saw what they would write or put on social media, they were negatively pulling my thoughts away from Jesus. So what's the solution for me if that's my problem? Well, I probably need to stop reading what certain people write on Facebook. I probably need to stop looking at what some people post on Instagram. I should instead fill my mind with whatever helps me to think about Jesus. So if I care about thinking more about Jesus, I probably should read good Christian books in addition to my Bible reading. I probably should limit my time on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. I probably should pray more for my family and for our church, and I probably should, all, should do all of this while drinking some good hot coffee. How about you, sisters and brothers and friends? You think about your own life. What in your life helps you to encourage your thinking for Jesus or stirs up your affections and love for Jesus? What is that? Or what is there in your life that actually robs and takes away your affections and love for Jesus? 
Do you need to make an adjustment in your weekly life so that you can think more about how excellent he is? So for me, I can only talk about myself. It's getting good sleep, drinking good coffee with Katie, not the Starbucks kind, listening to relaxing music, and reading a good book. When I do any of those things, man, it really stirs up more love and thinking about Jesus. Maybe it's the same for you, or maybe it's something else. I don't know. We're all different. But whatever it is, please think about what is excellent. Please think about Jesus Christ and his gospel. Romans 12, verse 2 tells us this. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. All right, so that was main point number one. Kind of long. Here's main point number two. Probably be a little shorter. Number two, follow excellent examples. Verse 9, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. <clears throat> now, two days ago, Friday, Katie Judson and I went to the grand opening of Ono Hawaiian Barbecue, South Pasadena location. So we were invited by the Wu family, and so as good Asians, we liked the buy one, get one free. Like, yes. Grand opening. And then they gave us coupons. So I'm looking through it. What can I get later? All right, since that place is busy, grand opening, first day, we decided, hey, William suggested, let's go to Garfield Park nearby in South Pass. And so while walking to the picnic benches, Katie mentioned to me that she saw the woos. I was walking in the front. I didn't hear her that well. And so I blurted out, what? And then she replied back to me with an exasperated tone, and then, ah. and again say, no, the woos are on the bench there. I then asked Katie, hey, why did you sigh? Why are you so annoyed? And I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? I mean, I only asked a question. I didn't hear her the first time. And what Katie said, said to me next made me shut up. It's because you were rude in how you spoke to me. You didn't have to talk to me like that. Now, I could fault Katie for how she responded to me, but I know I couldn't. So Friday night and then really all day yesterday, I kept thinking that my initial behavior and my words to my wife were a very poor example to her. She was really only following my not-so-excellent example. So whose fault was it? Not really hers. Mine. If I, as the husband and the leader of my family, am not leading and serving my wife and my son well, then I really shouldn't be surprised when she and he respond with frustration at my poor example. Now, last month, we talked about discipleship and discipling from Philippians chapter 3, did we not? Here's the verse to remind us, Philippians 3.17. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. And now here in verse 9, Paul is telling the Philippians to do and practice what they've learned and received from him. He also tells them to practice and do what they have heard and saw from him. All right, and what did they hear and see? Well, Philippians 1, 29 and 30. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. So Paul is saying, follow my excellent example. Follow my example in believing in Jesus. Follow my example for suffering for Christ with joy. Now, the reality is that all of us here, no matter how young or how old we are in this room and watching, we are all influencing somebody. We are all being influenced 
every single day of our lives, and what we allow to influence us will affect what we think about. Nobody is immune. So if we follow excellent examples, we will what? Think about what is excellent. But if we follow bad examples, I think it'll be more difficult to think well in Jesus' name. All right? So, am I pursuing this kind of relationship? That's a question for all of us. Are we finding and following people who are examples? Are we echoing the excellent? Now, if we are honest with ourselves, we can have a tough time finding someone to follow. Maybe we do not have a mentor in our lives to disciple us, right? I I want a mentor. I want someone to disciple me. There isn't anybody to find. So what can I do? Well, here are a few words of wisdom on the screen from a sister in Christ who lives in the Charlotte area. She writes this. Over my years serving in local church women's ministry, I have heard a consistent desire from women of various ages, stages, and life situations. I want an older woman to mentor me. It's a good desire and a model Paul commends in Titus 2, 3 to 5. The difficulty tends to come in how these relationships practically work out. As a younger woman, we tend to view mentoring as a one-way street. The older woman pours into me. I come to her with questions and burdens, and she responds with wisdom and prayer. If we're honest, some of us approach older women like a godly in-person Google search or an on-demand counselor. But this approach won't only rob us of much of the beauty of sharing life with an older woman, it may also push her away. Of course, it's not bad to ask a mentor questions. When I have time with the older woman who's informally mentored me for years, you can be sure I take the opportunity to ask for advice. But I've learned as much or more over the years by asking her about her life as I have been by asking her about mine. Mentoring relationships work best when we approach them as a shared responsibility and opportunity to grow together. If you're a younger woman longing for this kind of relationship, a good place to start is considering how you can be a good mentee. So if I desire to follow excellent examples, I need to be prayerfully active in finding somebody. I should honestly and humbly initiate by asking someone to meet with me, to talk to another believer. I should faithfully then follow up with that person who is discipling and mentoring me. I don't have to wait. But you know, this truth goes the other way too. If I'm a disciple of Christ, I am called to make disciples. Like the Apostle Paul here, I should be an excellent example for others to follow. Because if I say I'm a follower of Jesus, but I am not intentionally and actively helping others in the church to follow Jesus, then what exactly do I mean when I call myself a Christian disciple? How do I understand the great commission to make disciples? So, Elder Tooby, Deacon Eon, Deacon William, We leaders of this church family, you know, we set the tone for LRC. The examples we show as leaders will go a long way in cultivating a culture of discipling. So let's do this together, brothers. Now, older saints of LRC, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has given us the awesome privilege to mentor, influence, and disciple younger sisters and brothers, so who can we invite and get to know? How can we help a less experienced believer with living as Christians in this Genesis 3 world? We can do this together. Why? Because we're all following Jesus together. Now, why is this so important? Why is it possible to think about what's excellent? Why can we follow excellent examples? Well, here's one reason, and it's this. Because the God of peace is with us. So the end of verse 9 says this, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if you're not a Christian here, or you're not a Christian, you're watching online, I just want to tell you that peace and purpose and joy in this life come only from the God of peace. 
And this God of peace is also called the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, came into this world to give peace to those who trust and believe in him. The good news of Christianity is that Jesus can give the peace that surpasses all understanding to anybody right here, right now. He can be with anyone who says no to sin and yes to him. It's a matter of what the Bible says is faith. It's the reality of trust. In his grace, in his mercy, Jesus offers salvation, a new life from sin and whatever else is eternally evil. But the Bible says you must believe. You must repent. And I just want to add, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Now, for those of us today who claim Christian citizenship in heaven, let's think about, let's remember the truth that we can experience the peace of God right now, right? Because the God of peace that says here is with us. He says, Jesus does, that to go to him when we are weary and burdened and hurting, he says that he will give us rest and peace for our souls. He says that he will be with us to the very end of the age. He gives us peace. And how do we know that? Hebrews 12, verse 2 from last week. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him he endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the joy Jesus had was to give us joy. His peace that he had was to give us peace. His love that he has is to give us love. Now, maybe this morning, maybe one or two of us, we have been struggling to think about what is excellent. Maybe our minds have been thinking too much about what is impure or immoral or dishonorable. Maybe my focus has been to follow examples that are ugly and false and nasty. If I'm honest before you all, I've struggled with these sins this past week. So if you are like me this morning, maybe this story I want to share can be a good reminder of the gospel. Now, during the attacks in Israel, the terrorist attacks two Saturdays ago, it wasn't just Jewish people or Israeli citizens who were affected. So I read that there was, <coughs> excuse me, a lady from the Philippines who moved to Israel six years ago to be a caregiving nurse, to work as a nurse. And then as I was reading, she got married last summer, I mean last September, and then she continued to care for her elderly patient. And while serving this 70-year-old patient two Saturdays ago, the town that they were in was attacked. Now, this Filipina nurse could have run away, said, I'm out of here, because she's not from Israel, she's not Jewish. But instead of abandoning her patient to save herself, which she could have done, she stayed with this grandmother. And sadly, this caregiving nurse, her Jewish friend, were both killed. Now I wonder, what would cause this nurse to stay and show unbelievable loyalty, as people have been saying, to another person. And they've only, they've known each other for six years. She was working for this lady, caring for her. Why end up dying when she could have saved herself? I would like to think that she was following the example of others that she has seen. I would like to think that she was thinking about what was excellent and honorable and good and just. And to me, 
her unwillingness to abandon a helpless person, her desire to stay and basically sacrifice and give her life, I mean, to me, it's, this seems a lot like Jesus Christ giving his life for sinners like us. And, that what's, and this is what makes the gospel such good news. Because Jesus dying on a cross saved us sinners from sin and death. Jesus rising again gives us peace and hope that death in this life is not final. It's the end of one chapter and the beginning of the next. And thinking about this example of love from this nurse makes me think about the example of love from Jesus. He is the truest truth. He is the one with perfect honor. He is the most just. He is the purest. He is the most lovely. He is the most commendable and admirable. He is the most excellent, and you and I are called to think about him. Now, I have no idea if this nurse was a Christian or a Jesus follower. I have no clue. But either way, her sacrifice can only make sense because of the perfect example and sacrifice of Jesus. And our hearts can be moved to think about this lady's sacrifice because it points to a greater and better sacrifice on the cross. And that, sisters and brothers, can remind us that you and I can keep going. We can keep thinking. We can keep following. I'll end with this. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to go through these two verses, Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9 in your word. Father, if we are honest, we struggle every day. We sin every day in thinking about what is excellent. We sin in not following good and excellent examples. We would rather follow bad examples. We would rather think about things that are not pure, that are not honorable, that are not just, that are not true. And yet, Father, by your grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, who is truth, and life, and purity, and is excellent, we can again and again, because of the cross and the resurrection, think about you. Think about the cross, and follow Christ, and follow good examples in our world. Father, our world just seeks to bombard us, and fill our hearts and our minds with so many things that are not of you. So Lord, help us. Help us to help one another, to think well, to love you with our minds, to grow in our affections and our love and our joy in Christ. And thank you, Lord, that the God of peace, the Prince of peace, Jesus Christ, is always with us because we trust and believe in him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.